Hey, everybody, welcome to Between a Sock and a Hard Place. Hopefully a fun talk to close out the day. I'll be honest, I've never given this one before, so we're really going to see how it goes. Uh, a little bit about me. My name is Sean, or Understudy 77. I am the paranoid, and I am a paranoid and the head of the Security Operations Center at Verizon Media. Uh, I have worked in or run several socks from government to managed service to private industry. I was a breach consultant in my past life. I am a one half of the Detections podcast, which is a weekly blue team related podcast. And to be honest, especially through COVID, I really, really suck at Twitter, but I do try to be relatively engaged there. So that's a little bit about me. We'll dive into kind of the topic at hand. So first, and I learned this kind of the hard way on Twitter, we really need to define what a SOC is um, before we get into this. And it's not system on a chip, as a lot of people thought. Um, so a SOC is a security operations center, or in most cases, or in, in our case, a place where analysts, um, security analysts or security engineers look for bad in an environment and look for external attackers. A um, couple disclaimers. First one. This is based on my experience, experiences of those I've spoken to. The industry is large. Definitions and reality change from place to place. So as I talk about some of this stuff, maybe this hits home, maybe it doesn't. Maybe you go, hey, I've never experienced anything like this in my life. However, we did query kind of some external people a little bit, and this is what we got back. Um, so I handpicked a little bit of these, admittedly, because they're funny. Um, so, you know, glorified security oriented tier one help desk support. Um, they watch the pew pews and report packet no nos, things that are just kind of humorous. Um, a couple of people said it was the place that keeps them from doing their job uh, or they push different training. And we'll, we'll get into some of those as we go. So, coming from this, and I'll leave it up so that people can kind of take it in, read a couple of them if they want to. Hopefully, they show up okay on the screen, but really, we're going to get into my opinion and something that I think has been largely lost among the industry. Um, and that is that a SOC is one of, if not the most important part of a security program. Now we could argue this all day. Um, I could make my own use cases for things like vulnerability management. I could make my own cases for, for fixing and patching and, and all those things. But even if you're on top of vulnerability management, you patch everything, you do these things, attackers are still going to attack. And somebody needs to be there to, to catch those attackers if you don't want to have an issue. Um, specifically because a good majority of attacks that happen today aren't even based on um, vulnerabilities. It's you know 91% of most attacks, depending on where you read, is because of phishing. So social engineering and phishing. So yes, yeah, security awareness and training also becomes very important, but somebody is going to get through and somebody needs to be there to protect the company from that perspective. So really, we ask ourselves, what are we here for? Well, we're here to find badness. We're here to protect users. That's what's important. That's what we need. That's what we want to do. Um, and we're, you're going to see this come back as we go because this part is particularly important and if not one of the most important statements that I will make throughout the course of this presentation. But before we dive into that, we really have to talk about what's the reality? What does the world actually look like? At least, you know, from what I've seen. Well, not quite as grand or grandiose as that big statement of find badness, protect users, right? Filled, often socks are filled with the least experienced individuals. They're given little to no trust or ability. They have relatively low visibility and often an over-reliance on tools. They deal with a mountain of alerts that they don't have any real control over. They're not empowered to find that root cause or to be honest, really any cause. They can't fix security problems. But they can escalate. Um, death by a thousand cuts is something that we'll dig into more later. And that's a really big one too. And, and lastly, this concept that a stock is a stepping stone, something that somebody needs to get out of, something that somebody kind of comes into, puts in their time, and then moves on. Um, and as we go, we're going to explain all of these in more depth. But first, let's talk about why. Why is it like this? Well, we can break that down into a couple different reasons. Often there's a lack of mission or purpose, that first slide that we talked about. There's a lack of trust in the personnel. You'll see, you see that twice between the two, but it this is a why as well. Um, tiered structures, swim lanes, you can do this, but you can't do this. Um, segmentation, infighting, and ego. It, 
tends to be a big part of our industry, like it or not, especially when you start talking about ranks and tiers and things like that. The need to justify itself to the business. Um, and my, my personal favorite, the one that I'm not even going to explain, because that's how it's done everywhere. Just not something I want to get into right now, but we are going to dig into these more and more as we go. Um, if you'll notice, basically the whole theme of this outside of the first page is going to be IT crowd. I hope everybody is interested in that. It's one of my favorite shows of all time. And I think they have a lot of very relevant gifts here. So before we dive into some of these issues, I'm going to take a quick drink. So let's hit these down a list, one-to-one -one, piece by piece. Lack of a clear mission or purpose. Well, what really brings this about or what, what comes if you don't have that? Well, that concept of dealing with a mountain of alerts that you have no control of, it's absolutely a big part of it. Not being empowered to find root cause or any cause. Well, if we really think about it, so if we, if we don't know why we're there, then how are we gonna be empire, empowered to find a root cause or figure out what happened or fix security problems rather than escalate them? Um, defining who and what we are up front becomes really important. Otherwise we'll run into this or one of my favorites, death by a thousand cuts. And this is something that I've seen in almost every sock that I've been in. And most of the socks that I've run had this problem when I went in too, where, oh, well, we have this thing. We're just going to toss that over to the sock. It can be their problem. We'll let them worry about it. So, you know, socks will often end up doing like things like network changes or things like account resets or just the whole manner of things that don't necessarily fall in line with that concept of a mission. So as we bring this back up again, you know, what are we here for now? Or what are we here for again? Well, we want to find badness. We want to protect users. So if you have a mission, if your mission is simple, it allows for a little flexibility, but it also allows you to stay on that mission. So you, you can really start to have this conversation as you do stuff. Well, network configuration changes. Does that help me find badness? Does that help me protect my users? Well, not really. Okay, so maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I should find some other team or maybe we should work on process and procedure that puts this where it should go. Um, if we go through some of the others, dealing with a mountain of alerts that we have no control over, that one becomes really interesting from a mission perspective because, yeah, maybe last, last month I dealt with 5,000 alerts. Did any of them turn into something? Were any of them bad? Um, am I so alert fatigued at this point that I'm not going to recognize bad from good, which we'll talk about alert fatigue a little bit more as we go too, but, you know, do we really need those alerts? Do they help us meet this mission? You know, as far as only being able to escalate, not fixing security problems. Um, is that what we're here for? Are we protecting our users by not fixing some of these core problems? You know, no, same thing with, you know, root cause or, or finding any cause. Like, are we really, are, are we not here to stop the bad? And can we not fit this concept of understanding how the bad got in and what happened into fixing the problem holistically, because if we can fix the problem holistically, then we might not have that problem again. To me, that absolutely fits into this mission statement that we have. It becomes really, really important. So let's go into the next one. Lack of trust in SOC personnel. Uh, you're going to see a lot of these same issues over and over again. Specifically, you know, in this one, we're, we're dealing with a mountain of alerts that we have no control over. We're not empowered to find that cause. We can't fix the problems. We're given little to no trust and it becomes a stepping stone or something that you can get out of. This one is particularly different though and particularly important um, because, and I, I just wanna kind of remind everybody of something as we break into this, you hired them, right? Like in my, in, in my perspective, I did hire the people that are on my team. Every person who was hired from, from my intern to my CISO was, was hired for that job for a reason. They had a skill. It's something that they could do. Because of that, it is my belief that they deserve an equal voice and they deserve trust. And we have to trust what they have to say. Um, I've had a saying for a long time, and I, I believe I've said it in almost every sock that I've ever run, specifically to my leadership um, or you know peer teams. Everybody has an opinion on sock. However, 
there are very few people who have to do the actual work day in and day out. So you end up with that issue where, well, I think SOC should be looking at this. I think it's tuned well enough. I think it's okay. I think everything is fine, but they don't have to then go do that work. They don't have to put up with it. They don't have to deal with it. They don't have to go through it. Um, and SOC is really interesting in the cybersecurity field, at least from my personal experience. It tends to be one of the only departments in security programs, especially for some of the bigger companies where, where the team that's doing the work oftentimes has very little say over what work they're doing. And just stop and think about that for a second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have another drink, but if you really stop and think about that, like conceptually, you know, if you're a consultant, if you're an engineer, like you're often telling your bosses, this is what we should be doing. This is the direction we should be going. This is why I'm doing that. But SOC specifically, oftentimes people go to their manager, they go up and they say, we should be doing this. And they go, well, you know, no, we're not going to do that. But, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with 5,000 alerts a day. I, I can't handle that. Well, you're just going to have to find a way to do it. Like, sorry, it just kind of is what it is. Um, get used to it move forward, push on, and you'll be fine. So the, one of the things that I found in, in both running socks and, and being in them, primarily being in them, which is why I don't tend to run them that way, is because so often these people aren't given a voice. Maybe it's because they're the least inexperienced individuals there, but that doesn't make them any less valuable than anybody else. If anything, they're a blank slate. They can bring in brand new ideas. They don't have years and years of bias associated from working at other places or, you know, their own set opinions of the industry. So like, it's really important to take that fresh look and that non-biased understanding and then really let people do things. And that kind of brings us into the next topic. This concept of tiered structures and swim lanes. There's a lot of really interesting pieces that we can pack apart, pack apart here. And I'm gonna be honest, um, this, is, <laughs> this is a massive topic not just this one, but this whole talk. So like the concept that I, I'm absolutely going to forget some things, there are absolutely going to be some things that I don't cover. I apologize for this. I am more than happy to have this conversation and talk way more in depthly about any of these with anybody who wants to reach out though. Um, tiered structures and swim lanes end up putting you in this position where like, because you're tier one, you definitely can't fix stuff. You definitely can't find root cause. You're just looking, you, you click buttons. You deal with this mountain of alerts that you have little to no control over and you click buttons. And oftentimes that leads you into this over-reliance on tools. And again, it's a stepping stone. It's something to move on from, it's something to get out of. It's something that I don't want to do this for more than a year and then I want to go do something cool. Well, here's the thing. Being a SOC analyst in the right SOC is really cool. But let's, let's talk about this a little bit more before we get into how cool it can be. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of really good studies out that talk about how many things people can look at per day. Um, roughly, an analyst can look at about eight alerts a day. Um, he's a bit of a different model, but it's, it's still really interesting when you look at more than eight, they start to get overwhelmed. And you come into this big over-reliance on tools. So I interview for analysts, and I have probably interviewed hundreds and hundreds of analysts. And I can tell you that I don't ask a single technical, like, let me take that back. I ask technical questions. I don't ask a single tool-based question. I don't ask a single memorization-based question. I ask very theoretical questions. So, you know, what would you do? Like if I put a suspicious email in front of you, what would you look for? And then we follow that path all the way through investigation and remediation. But where were my thoughts on that one? Um, one of the things from these interviews that I find out is, is gross majority, not a gross, but a decent majority of the people that I interview, unfortunately, they're, they're stuck in the tool. So they go, well, I would look at FireEye HX and I would see what that says. Or I would look at CrowdStrike or, you know, I'll, I'll go to my, my firepower devices and I'll look at that. And when you really start to dig into like what happens after that, why did that thing fire? Why is this a thing? You, you don't get a lot of answers that exist there. Um, and I think that that's a problem, a really big problem with 
not only, you know, the way we run SOX today, but this concept of a tiered structure, there's no encouragement to learn. So I'll let the GIF play real quick here for a second, um, and then we'll continue on. So, so I, I ask everybody and I encourage people to ask the question, like, why put a stopper on progression? Like, really? Why put up an artificial barrier on somebody who wants to do well? Why tell your intern that they can't touch a thing? Why tell your brand new hire fresh out of college that they're not allowed to investigate this? Um, I've quit. I actually quit my second InfoSec job because I was told you're not allowed to do malware analysis. That's what the tier three people do. Well, how am I supposed to learn it so I can get to tier three? Well, that's not our problem. But, but why? Why do we need the artificial barrier? Why does that have to exist? So I would encourage anybody, have tiers, but do it based on expectations. My brand new guy right out of college, I'm not going to expect the same thing from him or her that I expect from somebody who's been with me for a long time or is a tier three, so to speak. But it doesn't mean I'm not gonna let him do the same things. He's perfectly capable and allowed to try his hand at doing all these things. In fact, that's how he's gonna grow. That's how he's gonna learn more. And that's how he's gonna become more valuable to me in the long term or her. So it becomes really, really important to, to not wall people in if you want to do this effectively. So now, you know, we, we have the, the concept of being walled in like just on the SOC side. So now we'll pivot over to the non-SOC side. We'll, we'll pivot in segmentation, infighting, ego, the things that happen with the SOC and everybody around them. Um, oftentimes you'll see friction amongst like SOC and IR teams or, or SOC and detection teams. So if, if we like, break and get like layout thought processy here for a second. There's really, you know, oftentimes you'll have a SOC and an IR team and maybe a detection team. And that's just within like the, the one group, right? But if you do that, you can have kind of a couple different setups where SOC will build all the detections or SOC will build none of the detections and have no say, or you can kind of do a hybrid where the SOC teams, the IR teams, where everybody kind of submits use cases, then they get prioritized. The detection team is the expert on the tool where the engineer builds those things and then they provide them to the SOC. Because to be completely honest, and I'm, I'm very for this method. Um, however, this method is very hard to pull off because of this problem, this segmentation, the infighting, and the ego, because you know people start to think they're better or it's just the SOC people or they don't really know what they're talking about. The reason that I'm so for it though, is because everybody kind of like has an expertise and it's very hard to say, I'm an excellent engineer. I can, I'm a mastermind on ArcSight or Splunk or whatever, and I can go build all this really cool stuff and I can make all these awesome things and I can make them work and be efficient and awesome and blah, blah, blah. Oh, and also I'm a master investigator and I can do log files and oh, on top of that, I can go do forensics and stuff too. So I don't necessarily disagree, especially when you get into a bigger company and I, at a relatively large company, and having some of that segmentation, but that segmentation of individual talent pieces, that doesn't make anybody worth less. Everybody just has their role. And then people can lean across the fence and they can learn more about other roles. And that's important. Um, one of the other problems that you have is not just within internal teams and partner teams, but you might run into a lot of issues with, you know, when you want to fix security problems or when you have, you know, low logs or you need to go out to to other teams or like the IT departments or like the help desk. There's often a lot of friction that exists there, um, often for the same reason. So it's important to be kind of understanding of that as we go into this. And we'll kind of dive into, so let's talk about that. Really, what's important in any of these cases is that none of us lose sight of the mission what we're here to do. Your personal ego doesn't really matter and it doesn't help the business. But here's my suggestion. And this one's a little bit harder because oftentimes you, you don't necessarily have control here, right? Um, but, but kill them with honey. Form strong partnerships early. Work with these other teams. Understand where they're coming from and what their thoughts are, but still be able to make yourself hurt. And Additionally, from like a leadership perspective, um, make sure that you explain well to your leadership why you make the decisions that you make. Have a business case. 
understand that concept of a business case. And really that's just justifying yourself with data and really being able to say, I have this data that leads me to believe that this is the best way to go. And this can be anything from, I'd like to institute a new policy that where we start blocking IP addresses to, you know, I really think we should have this detection because our sector is blah and blah sector says, you know, I'm reading threat reports about blah sector. So all those things become really important, but then we'll dive into kind of the next one. And that next one really is this need to justify itself to the business. I'm going to, I'm going to say a word that everybody's going to instantly groan. I'm just going to hear a whole bunch of, well, I'm not going to hear anything because I can't, because this is virtual. Typically, if I were to give this in person, I would expect to hear a bunch of ugs, metrics, the importance of them. However, also how often they're misused. And these lead to a lot of things, low visibility, over-reliance on tools, but specifically dealing with a mountain of alerts that you have no control over. This is one of the biggest things about metrics because when most people think metrics in a SOC, they go, well, SOC handles alerts. The number of alerts that they handle clearly says how well they do their job. So if Jimmy closes 5,000 alerts and Ben closes 1,000 alerts, Ben's not a good employee. Ben should probably be fired. Why isn't Ben working as hard? Also, hey, executive, look, we closed 10,000 alerts altogether. Like, we're awesome. Like, we closed 5,000 more alerts than we did last month. Look how good we are. That's awesome. Really cool. This is where we need to be. This is what we need to care about. So, I, hopefully there are some groans, maybe not, but hopefully. So let's talk about that a little bit. Also, I would like to present to you the internet, which is one of just my favorite things in the world. So, you know, spin a good yarn. It's not just about telling a story. It's about telling the right story. And I can't impress the importance of that enough that I'm going to say it a second time. Metrics are important but it's not about telling a story. It's about telling the right story. It's about being open and clear and honest. You need to talk about the ups and the downs. If you go into a meeting with your CISO and you go, this is where I am, that individual should leave that meeting going, this is good work, but I'm still worried about these things. What that means is that you've been honest with him. Also, interestingly enough. And I think there was a talk earlier about executives protecting themselves. And I caught a little bit of this. Um, there, there's a saying that I've said a lot, you're, you're very unlikely to get a life raft unless you're drowning um, in the world. So you really need to have this concept and this focus of like, I need to be honest. So I'll tell you, I was at a, a managed service provider once upon a time. Um, I'm not going to say where, but one of the things that I started looking at is analyst workload in workflow capacity. And capacity is something that's fascinating to me because it's always gonna be a little rough. There's not really a good way to do it perfectly, but you can get an idea of what things look like. In this case was just taking the total number of analyst hours that I had versus the alerts that were coming in for the clients that we had saying, what does that look like? How much time do these guys have per alert? It's such a powerful number. If anybody's curious, the number was 3.5 minutes. So I had a team of analysts who had 3.5 minutes per alert to investigate, make a determination and close. If any of them actually involved more investigation and took longer, that would hurt the rest of the team because more alerts were gonna come in. So why is that so strong? That's so strong because we, could, we used that goal to enact change. We said, hey, we need to buckle down and focus on tuning. We need to fix this because the gross majority of this stuff is false positive as well. So we really need to buckle down and we really need to fix this. And, and I use a method, if anybody's curious, uh, fidelity, frequency, and impact. So how bad is it? What is the overall fidelity? Like how often is it false positive, true positive? And then frequency, how often it fires? And I kind of rate on that triangle to make tuning decisions. But because I had that number, we were able to say, you know what? Next quarter, we want that to be five minutes. And you might say five minutes is not a big deal. But it's, and it's true, it's not. But it's moving in the right direction. It's moving forward and strong incremental steps are helpful. So this concept of being able to have numbers and tell your story, 
Like it's about knowing what story you want to tell and then being able to tell it. I've taken the capacity stuff that I've done there to almost every place that I've ever gone because I find it to be so interesting and so cool to know, but I have expanded on it a little bit and we're going to talk about that as we get into kind of a use case. Um, but it's not just things like that. It's understanding your threat model, understanding where your focus is. Like those are things that are important. Most of the threats that come in are the email. Well, cool. What are we doing on email? Oh, if 90% of our threats are actually email, like the rest of the industry, maybe I now have a use case to go get email. Um, if I can't verify stuff and I have so many things that are unverified or I couldn't verify like what website somebody actually downloaded something from, I now have a business use case and a justification potentially to go get a web proxy. I can show why those things matter. And that's really important is being able to back up what matters with data. I know everybody hates metrics and hates numbers, but I guarantee to you, they don't have to be bad. Trust me, they don't. They can be used for good and they can be used honestly. So last one, because that's how it's done everywhere. This concept of industry standard. Um, basically, all the problems can fall in because that's how it's done everywhere. It's, it's not uncommon for somebody to say, I'd really like to have a, a chat with you about what an industry standard SOC is, or you know, my understanding of the industry standard. I'm really not gonna justify this one because my response is always, I don't think the industry standard is very good. Plus, why should we be held to that? Brings me to a really interesting point. And this one actually makes me really angry most of the time. We are hackers. We challenge norms, we innovate, we adapt, we fight for the right change. That's what we're here for, that's what we do. So, so why do we talk about industry standard like it's something that has to exist? Why? That's my curiosity. Why is it that we need to go down this path of being like everybody else? It's, so, it's, it's the antithesis to basically our entire identities as tinkerers and changers and people who fight. Side tangent, but still one worth talking about, I think. So we're going to put this all together. And this is just going to be me talking. So there's, there's not really a slide after this. So I'm going to talk for a little while. Let's take all this stuff and let's put it together. So first, we come in, we have a SOC. What's the mission of that SOC? I'm going to use the one that I laid out. Find badness, protect users. So we have that mission. We can now start to ask a lot of really good questions. Um, and I'm actually going to give a shout out to Mark Orlando's Building a SOC A Team Talk, which you should totally listen to, because he talks a bit about this concept of state of flux. This stuff changes all the time. It has to. Um, I've had employees who, when I would go into a place and I would start doing stuff, would go, hey, when are we going to get to stable? And I would say, this is the new normal. Well, I'm not interested in it. I said, well, that's okay. I mean, I, you're welcome to stay. You, when you find a new job, awesome. Part of meeting that mission is asking some questions. So that first question is, are we going to get to a state of done? Well, no, not really. Attackers change all the time. We have to change too. New technology comes out, new things. There is no done in defensive work. It's just not a thing. So we can't pretend that it is. Um, as we continue down into that mission, we, we start really quantifying this concept of like, okay, so how do we meet that? What do we do to meet our mission? Well, nobody else is looking at alerts, so we should probably do that, especially because, you know, there's, there's something to be said about having consistent alerting. It's not something that I disagree with. So what do we need to set up? What does our threat model potentially look like? What are we worried about? Okay, let's set up a core set of alerts. None of the out-of-the-box crap. If we're going to set up the out-of-the-box crap, that's cool, but we got to customize it. We got to do it slow. We can't fall into that trap of being buried under a mountain of alerts and having alert fatigue problems and having analysts who can't do it. Like human beings need not just consistency, but like human beings need a bit of a challenge. If you give them the same thing over and over again, they're going to get bored and they're going to make mistakes. So, okay, we need alerts, but we know that we need those alerts to be interesting, investigatable, not just a bunch of crap to make our numbers. Cool. So we're getting somewhere. So we know we have that. How are we going to get those? Well, we have threat models. We can look at that. We can look at what's normal in the industry. Uh, I had mentioned, you know, 91% of uh, attacks start with a fish. 
well, okay, maybe let's start focusing on mail. That's a good place to start. Um, if you're a window shop, most malware is PowerShell. It starts with PowerShell. Hey, that's a cool place to start too. So let's start thinking about how early we can catch something. Because what are we here for? We're here to find badness. We're here to protect users. So how early in that chain can we find something? How early in that chain can we stop something from happening? That becomes really important too, because it's not like, well, I don't really care about the email until somebody clicks on it and there's an infection. For every analyst who's ever told me phishing is for noobs, that analyst can fuck right off. Um, and this might have been the first time I've sworn in, <laughs> in this entire talk, which is uncommon, but still. Attackers use it. It's important. And guess what? Stopping that email rather than stopping somebody's exposed credentials or exposed data or a piece of malware is by far the better way to go. Lower risk. Again, when you start talking about numbers, though, you can start to use that. Well, you know, we stop this many emails, which means we stop this many potential security threats. Our job is to stop potential security threats. Cool. So we've got some things. We, we kind of know how we want to build some detections and stuff. We figure out who might need to build that. We, we kind of work through that. Cool. So what else, what else do we need? Obviously, we need more than just, you know, alarms coming in, right? Otherwise, we're not really going to meet that mission. So, well, how can we break that out? So I'll tell you what I've done and what's worked for me. I say, you know what? I'm going to build a capacity model. And I do. And I say, this is how many alerts I'm anticipating are going to come in. This is the percentage. But before all that, I do a couple of things. I take off a little bit of time for overhead because it's important. People need to talk to each other, go to the bathroom, do all those things. In the consulting world, we ran at what's called 70% utilization. So the expectation was that we were working or billable 70% of the time. I carry that into my teams. I expect them to be at about 70% utilization. However, before I even get into running numbers across how many alerts they handle, I go, you know what? If I want to get an understanding of what we're doing and I want to know what they're doing, I break that up. So I say, we're going to put 15% of each analyst time on a weekly hunt rotation or a weekly log source rotation. What that means is, hey, we've got some low fidelity stuff that exists out there. Maybe we've got some log sources that are interesting. Maybe we just want to go troll through data and see if we can find something that sticks out. 15% of each analyst's time is spent doing that across multiple log sources. Then I take another 15% and I say, hey, 15% of your time is going to is also going to be done, or you know, in addition to, you're going to spend another 15% on a monthly rotation. And that rotation can be things like documentation, which is really boring. Um, but it's necessary, especially as we talk about maturity. But it can also be learning a new tool or doing research, which is something that I think is really, really important for SOC analysts. And one of my research kind of expectations is that you come out of that with an understanding of a breach and how we can detect, detect, or pick a MITRE attack category, or tell me how we can detect something that exists there. Do the work investigate how this stuff works, set up some VMs, do all that stuff, look into it and figure something out and make our program better. Because that's how we show that we're getting better. And when we talk about the metric stuff, the number of alerts doesn't really matter. We can't do anything with that. We don't control how many alerts come in. You know what we do control though? We control this concept of, do we see more than we used to see? Um, are we looking for things in new ways? Are we covering our, our basis and our attack basis? MITRE is really cool for this, the MITRE attack framework. And I know people beat it to death in talks, so I'm only gonna mention it for a second. But it's really cool to say, hey, you know, we have detections for this many MITRE categories. Um, and we're constantly building more. And in the last month, we built like four more things. We expanded our visibility, we have new log sources, we have new stuff. That's how you show you got better. That's how you tell that story that says, we got better. We don't control how many alerts come in. We don't control what the bad guys do or girls. What we do control is our ability to look for things in new and interesting ways. It's really, really important to tell that story. And then, you know, we talk about threat model and all that stuff. So one of the other rotations is like a hunting exercise. So doing a month long hunt with a bunch of other teams. Also a really interesting and valuable thing. It, forces other teams to get together and to work together as peers. It moves everybody forward a little bit. Um, 
there's a lot of benefit in general to doing it, but coming out of anything like that, we also then meet and we talk about, okay, what new detections might we have there so that we can kind of complete this concept of a life cycle that says, we went looking for this, maybe we found something, maybe we don't, but what worked really well, what can we codify, what can we make normal? And then we basically complete this life cycle, but it's so important for the analysts to continue to do this and to think in this way um, and think about kind of the big picture, why they're there. What don't I see? What aren't I looking for? It's not just about that alert that comes in. Um, so, that, you know, we talked a little bit about capacity model. So to continue down, I take 15%, 15% right off plus, you know, 30% off the top. And then I go, okay, so like average triage, not investigation, triage, maybe 15 minutes. When we get into something that's investigation worthy, it's gonna have a ticket, let's give that some additional time. And then we start to calculate the total number of events that we have come in, minus all this other stuff that I do want my people to do because this stuff is important to me. And we can get a percentage, we can get a amount of time per event, but we can also get a percentage. So we can say, I'm at 112%. Well, what that means is, you know, my other stuff suffered because I have 30% set aside for it. But what that means to me when I go to the business is, hey, I need people or we need to limit scope because these are the things I expect my people to do and they're not getting to them. And here's the proof. Here's the data. Here's how this works. Um, one thing that works really well with this that we didn't really cover at all, because again, giant topic, automation. You know, can we bring in an automation provider? Can we use a, a Phantom or a Domisto, which I think Domisto has a new name now? Um, and can we get rid of the crap and again, back to mission, the stuff all syncs together. Back to mission, can we get rid of all the stuff that doesn't let us focus on the mission? Do I really need to go do a whole bunch of data enrichment? Do I really need to do a bunch of ticket entry? Does that make sense? Is that a good use of my paycheck and my time? Or am I better off actually investigating things and then clicking a button and having the ticket get made for me? That's what I'm for, personally. Um, we continue to talk about that concept of building strong partnerships. And then lastly, really, you know, you reach out, you build these partnerships and you tell your story. And that's where things get really important. And we talked about this a bit, but hopefully coming through this, you see, you, you'll see that like you can tell this story, you can solve these problems. And you could actually probably talk to some of my employees and maybe they tell you that none of these problems have been solved. I'd like to think that we run a pretty cool shop, but I mean, they are really the judge of that, not me because they're the ones who have to do this work every day, not me. But like, it gets so important to trust these people, let them do their job, let them explore, let them expand, let them bring new ideas. Because no one person knows everything. No one person is ever going to know everything. And if we hire somebody, let's let them teach us something. That's really important. And then let's use that and let's tell our story and let's talk about why. What do we do? What are we really here for? And how do we protect the company? Really protect the company. I'm not saying look at an email of a, of a, look at a phishing email and then open a ticket. I'm saying, look at a phishing email, go look for it across the entire network, find out that it got sent to 300 people and then have 300 emails removed from inboxes while you're simultaneously going and looking to see if anybody interacted with it, not just clicked on it because ultimately that might not matter most of the time but interacted, gave up credentials and then doing credential resets and so on 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 and looking for any place that those credentials are used. That's the job, in my opinion of the job anyway. And again, opinions may vary, but that's the job. Um, and that's what I think I, I really want the rest of the industry standard to get to. I really want us to start focusing on why we're there and not feeling like, oh, SOX is the boring place that people leave from, because it doesn't have to be. It really doesn't. And hopefully throughout the course of this, um, as I kind of jump to the last slide here, there's some, some contact details, but hopefully through the course of this, it, you know, I have taught or carried on some things or some ideas that maybe people who are doing this, either in leadership or not in leadership, either way, can take home and really say, hey, maybe I should talk to my team about this, or maybe this would be useful. Or if you're not on a SOC team, maybe take a minute and say, hey, maybe I should thank my SOC team for the work they do and include them a little bit more because they know stuff and they're valuable and they have a very unique view into, the, into um, you know, 
what's going on. With all that being said, I, I have a slide for questions, but I assume as this has gone most of the time, questions will be answered in the in the track Discord, which I will jump into. You can find me on Twitter at, at understudy77 or my weekly podcast at detections.org, which tonight at eight, we had the opportunity to interview Kim Zetter, which is super duper exciting. And I'm super excited to chat or to share the chat with her. It was really good on election security and digital privacy and, and surveillance tech and writing a book and Stuxnet and all kinds of cool stuff. But anyway, thank everybody for your time. Thanks Circle CityCon. This has been awesome. I am done. But I don't know when I'm out. So maybe someone will tell me. Thank you, Sean, for the fantastic talk. No, uh, you, you are out. Cool. How'd it go? It went well. We're still live, though, so uh, we can catch up on Discord in a minute. Oh, am I still live? Yes. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm still live. And with that, that was our last talk of the day in track three. So I'd just like to remind you all that at four o'clock Eastern time, we're going to have our closing keynote and our closing ceremonies. It's going to be over in track one. Thank you so much for coming to Circle City Con. And I hope we see you at the closing keynote.